So we're on to the second session, which I've called The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And it's about national, early nationalism, romanticism, and what is traditionally called utopian socialism. And we'll explain that as we get to it. So uh, the first si slide, sort of a continuation with the what we were doing at the end of last week with the conservative response to the uh, revolution. And I want to talk a bit about what has come to be termed the uh, counter enlightenment. The a period, a reaction from the late 18th century on that defied enlightenment assumptions. And particularly the, the two enlightenment assumptions that I start off with at the top of the screen here, human art and science are the drivers of progress, just a working assumption for all the philosophes, and that the future would bring new modes of social relationships crafted by evolved enlightened thinking. The revolution was intended to rationalize and improve on the historical model that was the ancien regime. What we're going to see in the um, counter enlightenment There we go. The counter enlightenment, uh, they didn't call themselves this. It was not a self conscious movement. But by the 1770s, a sensibility developed in certain quarters, uh, certainly a minority of thinkers and artists, that took issue with the Enlightenment program. And particularly, I've, I've, I've highlighted couple of contrasts at the very top of the slide, you'll notice. I've, I've suggested that nature is going to be uh, a concept opposed, juxtaposed to artifice. The Enlightenment, if anything, was, was, had tremendous faith in artificiality, uh, oddly enough, it didn't have the same uh, pejorative or negative associations as it would today. It was seen as gracing human and gracing the world with artful construction. It was an improvement on nature. But now we're going to have people suggesting that artifice in the very modern sense is, is a contrivance, that second heading there, uh, that it opposes the organic. If you had asked uh, perhaps David Hume in the middle of the 18th century uh, to put a positive or negative valence on the word organic and the word nature, uh, and the same thing with artifice and contrived, probably he would have, and I'm only singling him out as a, as a cipher, but probably he would have said, well, artfulness and human uh, construction are more desirable than what you get in raw nature uh, and the organic. So some of the assumptions that we're going to see going forward in the Counter-Reformation is that nature is a better arranger than rational thought. Don't mess with the ecosystem. Yet again that traditional social relationships, family, tribe, and they're going to add uh, the conceptual new term, nation, nation, as, and as the German philosophers start pushing very heavily in this period, are superior to newly constructed systems. The nation was seen as sort of an extension of tribe. So it's going to be linguistic-based, uh, and tribally based, clan based. And it's going to have, as we will see, upsides and toxic sides, uh, as all tribalism has warm, fuzzy associations, family, the nest, warmth, the hearth fire, and uh, the more what we've come 
to decry uh, the negative aspects of, of tribalism. And, that, and finally, that feelings, emotional intelligence here, feelings are more authentic and valuable than ideas, which are usually seen as washed out and, and not filled with the vim and vigor of, of the response of the blood. So 19th century politics and thought and art are going to be heavily influenced by both sides of this, these two 18th century traditions. The Enlightenment and its critics Many aspects of the topic that I've chosen today, and we're going to focus on those sides, nationalism, romanticism, and utopian socialism were particularly influenced by the counter-enlightenment's core beliefs. So if last week we established in looking at the revolution contributions made by enlightenment thought, the rationalization of law and the like. Today we'll be looking at the, the passionate underbelly of, of what immediately follows. So uh, moving on, I did not so arbitrarily choose uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau as uh, the example or the exemplar of counter-enlightenment. Uh, he is by far the, the thinker who jumps to mind when you think of the counter-enlightenment because he was a, um, a political genius. He was a philosopher, a novelist, a political theorist, uh, the enfant terrible of the enlightenment. He's a lionized lira, literary hero of both the revolution and as we'll see of the counter-revolution. His rejection of enlightenment, rationalism, optimism, and progress stunned his peers. People like Voltaire, people like David Hume later on, uh, were staggered by his willingness to make the objection that civilization, as he does on his, as I mentioned here, in his discourse on inequality, that civilization is a retrograde development. It's not an improvement. As he, as he begins another document, the social contract, with the line, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. And the natural man, the man at his own disposal, the savage in nature um, is, is now the desirable man, Adam before the fall. It's civilization that brings out uh, his dark side. And, and, and Rousseau will make this distinction between what he calls uh, appropriate self-love, amour propre, with what he calls self-love with a kind of ugly connotation, uh, amour de soi, which he argues is born in uh, the cravings for property and the cravings for dominance over one's fellows. And, and he makes this distinction that one is the product of nature and one is the warping effect of civilization. So his view of the individual as uh, alienated from an oppressive society uh, it strikes a very modern note. I mean, you, you know, the, the angry young man of every literature from Rousseau to the present is born in Rousseau. His best-selling um, essay, it's, it's, a, it's a full book, I call it an essay here, The Emil, or On Education, describes an impossibly ideal child-centric education free from coercion. The tutor is given the, the adolescent Emile, and his job is not to subject him to uh, external authority, to force him 
into a mold, which, which arguably is what a lot of education does, but to let him, to lead him in a way that only the constraints of the natural world form the young person, that, that he learns freely in nature what his powers are uh, and doesn't learn the lessons of coercion because to be coerced is to coerce someone else ultimately. And finally, his focus on the romantic uh, the, the focus on sentiment, on subjectivity, on inspiration, uh, everything that characterizes, what, 90% of 19th century art, if not all of it. His, he even writes a, a bestseller sentimental novel, Julie, or the, the new Eloise, or La Nouvelle Eloise was a sensation, a million copies, probably not, but it gets translated into every language in Europe. And, and I just steal a quote from it to give you, I mean, all this prose purple or what, but I tremble as often as our hands meet. And I know not how it happens, but they meet constantly. I start as soon as I feel the touch of your finger. I am seized with a fever or rather delirium in these sports. My senses gradually forsake me. And when I am thus beside myself, what can I say? What can I do? Where hide myself? How be answerable for my behavior? So his cup runneth over. His emotional cup runneth over. And indeed, this novel is quickly followed upon by people like the young Goethe, uh, who writes uh, The Sorrows of Young Werther, Werther's Leiden, in which the two young lovers uh, forbidden to consummate their love by an oppressive external society with its bourgeois notions of propriety. And the only out they have is, is dual suicide. And of course, this is the age of lovers leaping off the cliff. Uh, and finally, an idealization of nature. We begin to find in Rousseau, and in writers heavily influenced by him, writers of the counter enlightenment. So he strikes a chord. The ideas of the revolution may have been rooted in the enlightenment, but I wanna suggest that the fervor and patriotic sentiment, the passion were expressions of this new mentalité, as the French would have called it. So uh, with that, Let's move on to the topic of nationalism. And I want to look at it in several different aspects. And the first one, as I say at the top of the slide, nationalism as liberation. So now we're talking about nationalism as a liberal universalist ideal and an enlightenment idea. And at its root, you see lots of people under the sway of the new idea of the nation as a brotherhood that is as pan-national, it's international. Uh, the Italian nationalists ran around using the phrase, Lui o, uomini liberi sono fratelli, all free men are brothers. So it extends, it's not tribal, it extends beyond national borders. Let us use the idea of our own nation as a gateway into the greater nation of humanity. Um, or as uh, the, the Roman, I forget who used the phrase first. but they would often refer to the empire as the gens humana, the human clan. Yes, it's a clan. And we come to it by bringing our, our familial, the best of our familial connectivity, but we bring it to a larger 
international setting. So Napoleon exploits this nationalism in this sense and conquered territories as a political strategy to consolidate control. And he says, in a quote from Napoleon on, on the right of the, the painting, peoples of Italy, the French army comes to break your chains. The French people is the friend of all peoples. Approach it with confidence. Your property, your religion, and your customs will be respected. We are waging war as generous enemies, and we wish only to crush the tyrants who enslave you. So we have Napoleon in Milan. And in this painting by uh, Albury in 1800, here is uh, this allegory of Napoleon as a liberator, and he's being offered uh, the laurel wreath. He's on his throne. He's the master, but he's being offered the laurel wreath. And, and, and this little side note here, I mentioned that Hegel, uh, in his grand historical scheme, argued that the agents of historical change, the movement from a thesis to antithesis to a new synthesis, the change agents were great men, men who straddle history, men who become the personification of what the uh, movement of history demands at the moment. And he uses this as grand example, Napoleon Bonaparte, as, as just the figure who's being called on to lead history forward to its, its next established step. Moving along, another version of nationalism, still a liberal and universalist ideal, but now it's, there's a side of it, which isn't an enlightenment idea, it's a romantic idea. And we see soon after uh, locals have gotten a dose of Napoleonic control, uh, there is this counter-revolutionary, uh, counter-enlightenment, romantic impulse to see the nation as who we are, or, the, or a folk, as, as the German word would have it, that, that our nation is not the nationhood of Napoleon, and so we should resist them. It's depicted as organic, as a spiritual instrument of universal liberty and truth. It's our way to come to uh, the spirit of the people, the geist of the folk. It's seen as culturally liberating and therefore ultimately universally human. So we, the German people, we, the Spanish people, we come to the universal ideal, but we do it through our own separate national feeling. And it brings us to a universal humanity. So I, I included just to get a sense of the way uh, people like artists, like the, gr the great Goya, Francisco Goya, uh, looks at idealizing, romanticizing political resistance as the, the people getting slaughtered by the forces of tyranny third of, on the 3rd of May, 1808. But two quotes from two German uh, philosophers of the period uh, who conveyed this sense of nationalism as romantic, but still as universal. So we find in, in Johann Gottfried Herder, as long as we keep our native language on our tongue, we will penetrate so much more deeply the distinctiveness of each language. Here we will find gaps, their superfluity, their riches, their a desert, and we will be able to enrich the poverty of the one with the treasures of the other. 
So go back to the mother tongue. Investigate its richness. Build it out from there. We will come to uh, a greater universalist humanity through our own narrower, private, native, but with the assumption organic and natural. And from Fichte, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, the man who probably did more to popularizing the actual word nation than, than any other theorist of, of the period. His belief and his struggle to plant what is permanent, his conception and what he comprehends, his own life as an eternal life, is the bond which unites first his own nation, and then through his nation, the whole human race, in a most intimate fashion with himself, and brings all their needs within his widened sympathy until the end of time. So here we have a nationalism that wants everyone to be free to express and indulge themselves in the ineffable spirit of the folk, not one that wants to uh, blow the heads off the, uh, the threatened enemy. Anyhow, also nationalism can be exclusionary and chauvinistic. And, and it tends uh, to show up in places at first that are very, very polyglot, like the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And if I zoom on this map, what you'll see, I chose this map because it basically shows uh, language centers. So German speaking, Hungarian speaking, Italian speaking, uh, in the Veneto, all within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Romanian or Romance language, but a different language. Polish, up in the north. Uh, Czech speaking. Uh, Carpathio-Ukrainian. I don't know whether that would now be just Ukrainian or what. Serbs and Croats, Slovaks, Slovenes and the boundary of the, the okay. So what you see in the map is uh, an old form of political entity that was dynastic and carved out of uh, and sitting on top of 15 or 20 different nationalities. Uh, I'm assuming that most of the Slavs in these, this grouping could, could speak, speak across their, their narrow languages to one another as they can today. Uh, so Ukrainians can sort of speak Russian and, and Serbian, for instance, but there's Italian, there's German, there, there's Hungarian, which is a language completely out of the Indo-European thing. And what you find here, movements towards uh, reform of any kind, pushes towards liberalism, will often put ethnicities at each other's neck. All of a sudden, uh, German speakers in Czech areas will take great umbrage at what they see being offered to appease Hungarian speakers in other parts of the empire. And so the, the rivalries for economic and social reform begin to take on uglier and exclusionary nationalist associations. After Napoleon, the demands for political reform and new constitution caused disruption in multi-ethnic areas, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, the bonds of the traditional political entity are weakened and result in nationalistic rivalry and competition. Language tends to become the basis of national identity. Literary languages develop as a counter to dialects. So one of the problems uh, with ethnic identification in this period is that not all Slavs 
um, speak the same language. Not all Greeks speak the same language. Not all Italians speak the same language, etc. In the 19th century, we see the, the solidification of literary languages that become the dominant, if you will, the proper language of their language group. So speaking for Italian, the Tuscan dialect, because of um, writers like Manzoni, uh, the Tuscan dialect becomes, if you will, uh, Italian. And for the next, um, now nearly two centuries, it takes nearly two centuries for it to become uh, the lingua Italia of the whole country. You could find, uh, oh, when I was very young, you could find people certainly in Naples who would have had trouble speaking Italian. But that would have been true in every rural part of Italy. Same with Greek, same with Slavic. And so national movements to, uh, to, to create a mother tongue, which leads us to a very odd point about nationalism, but uh, a very important point about nationalism, which is that although the mythos of nationalism wants to point to a golden past, wants to revolve this nostalgic, revive the nostalgic ideal of, of a, golden, a golden source, a mythology of the, of the people, a, a foundation myth, a creation myth. And, and so that the idea of nation presupposes the idea of an old organism, yet nationalism is a modern construction. And language reform is part of that novel modern construction. It's new. Nations get invented. They weren't there. The myth is to make them there. Um, and, um, and a quote from one of the Italian reformers at the, that, I'll, that I'll cite at the point of Italian unification when we talk about it in the last session, uh, the reformer uh, Bazzelio makes the very telling comment, we have made Italy, now we have to make Italian. And he's right. So liberal reform, in all these places, is dominated by an intelligentsia, the educated sub-elites, students, soldiers, journalists, what uh, in German is called the, the Mittelstand. Uh, doesn't mean middle class exactly, but it does mean those who stand between workers and peasants on one hand, and the uh, aristocratic uh, powers that be on the other. And, uh, and the awakenings of both liberal reform and nationalist identity are driven by these cultural elites, which they are. Karl Marx later on will point to this as the major flaw in bourgeois reform. It's top down, it's led by this narrow minor minority, it's idealistic, it's not rooted in material necessity. And so as soon as you know, the liberal reformers uh, will start what Marx will call their play revolutions. And as soon as the bullets start flying, all of a sudden, uh, they will be very drawn to the idea of law and order. And, and, and reform is out of the works. Later in the 19th century, toxic nationalism, uh, as we now think of it in the 21st century, will result from mixing nationalism with the influences of whoops, racialism and social Darwinism, which is a concept that we will talk about in It all ties together. Now, 
In this slide, I want to start talking about the idea of nationalism and, and the romantic treatment of it. Uh, and, and the first point I want to make is that this, this invention of the past is an invention of nostalgia on the part of the Romantic movement. The nation's golden age is mystically remembered and idealized. And that hand in glove with this is often a return to uh, medieval foundation myths. Remember, the Enlightenment regarded the medieval period as a dark age that they were just digging themselves out of. That's why the Renaissance through to the Enlightenment wanted to resurrect Roman classicism because they saw it as superior, not dark and tribal and non-rational. But here, it's now remembered with, with a, a, a corona of a hazy glow of nostalgia wrapped around it. Uh, medievalism and mythology as social, cultural, and artistic models. So we have the, I'm going to talk about this in the next two slides, the, the tales of Ashen, Arthur and the Round Table, the Ring Saga, all are, are 19th century uh, constructs. The natural wonders of the homeland are sentimentalized in landscape paintings. We have the lake poets, the Hudson River School, uh, and we'll look at a couple examples. Uh, I have a Jericho painting on the lower left. Here, I should. And here we have um, the benign countryside, ruins, some of the folk, uh, a glow, the glow of sunset, uh, nature and man in their traditional idealized setting. And on the right, this is a bridal procession. We're in Norway on the Hardangerfjord by Adolf Tiedemann and Hans Gude, done in 1848. I have to head a little. I could not resist this painting. Because uh, if this isn't on some Norwegian Hallmark card, I can't imagine why not. Uh, Look at this idealization. I mean, you can feel the cool, pured water and the clean mountain air and the participants in the wedding, the folk seen at their best. I had mentioned on the previous slide uh, medievalism, and I specifically had mentioned Ashen which I want to focus on. It's a cycle of Gaelic epic uh, poetry that was allegedly by a legendary blind bard named Ashen. And why are all bards blind? I guess so they can have the inner eye and can sing the songs that are to be memorized. And it's published by a Scottish poet named James McPherson in the 1760s, um, who claims he discovered and translated them. And they celebrate the uh, life, love, and battles of a hero. Fingal is the hero. And they caught fire, uh, not just in Scotland and England, uh, again, they were published in every European language, and people thought they were on to a modern Homer, but a Homer of the Celts, very closely aligned with, with um, the Germans, a Homer of the Northern Europeans. So it catches on wildly in all of Northern Europe. And here we have an early painting, The Blind Poet, singing, he's got his lyre. Uh, again, the, the idealized seer, the blind seer, 
And on the right, uh, taken from one of the songs, Asher has a dream of the heroes of Valhalla. And, uh, and again, it's Ang with that just unbelievable photorealistic capability that he had. Love the way he does the uh, the ghosts as monochrome and the color barred in the foreground. Whoop, let's get back. And again, the poems were immensely popular. They reached a wide audience across Europe. Their appeal to the romance of the heroic national past is so compelling that Napoleon commissioned two paintings uh, based on them. Uh, one I, I hear by Anne-Louis Giraudet, the women poem. Um, by the way, the poems were most certainly forgeries and were suspected even by their contemporaries. There was a big debate that involved Samuel Johnson and others over whether or not McPherson had made this stuff up to, uh, to push his career along a little better. If we look at this, here we see ah, the, French, the dead of the French army, Napoleon soldiers being welcomed into the halls Valhalla, and uh, Napoleon wanted this for one of his new palaces. Gerard did one of the, did the other. And Giraudet's painting, uh, this is from some commentator that I found on the web, but I like the description. Giraudet's painting, the heroes surround the blind poet in Valhalla, in fanatical devotion and ready for battle. In his train, we see fallen warrior heroes of history illuminated as with an inner radiance and as if in reward, surrounded by fairy-like floating maidens. Um, I love it. Uh, my, my guess is that things like the, the Marvel comic films, and X-Men and, and that sort of thing are in this grand tradition somewhere. And, and then on, um, oh, very good, Jeff. The opera addict has helped us again. Werther's Ari and Massenet's opera, uh, Werther is an Ashen poem. Thank you. Um, well, which brings us to uh, the idea of musical nationalism or nationalistic music. Uh, I didn't go further with this other than this half a slide because uh, I would have wanted to play things, but I'm not a big fan of uh, trying to get sound quality over Zoom. So if you like, go listen to stuff on your own. But the first thing I want to mention is that the entire uh, Wagner ring is based on the Nibelungen lead, um, the, the Song of the Nibelungs, the great family of the Nibelungs, Siegfried and company. And, and, and a lot of the myth of German identity is told through the stories of the ring. And unfortunately, uh, as many people will point out Wagner was much beloved of the National Socialists in the 20th century and did a lot of damage to the idea of both Wagner and nationalism at large. But, but Wagner is, the, is in German music and in fact what McPherson was in Scottish poetry. I mentioned also uh, that this is the age, the 19th century, of folk dances and themes from folklore and village life being used 
by, I mean, too many people to mention, by 50 composers. You know, you get dozens of things, Hungarian dances, Polabestian dances. You, you get, let's go back to village life, see the simple, happy folk uh, singing the songs of our fathers and mothers. And, and the, the sources are myriad. We have nationalist themes in, among others, Chopin and Glinka and Smet and Dvorak. The, the Czechs were phenomenal nationalists in music. Grieg, Sibelius. And, and I did want to point out that uh, Verdi's Nabucco, the opera that put him on the map, and that he, I think, finished in 1841 and had its early productions in 41 and 42, uh, at the height of the growing resistance in Northern Italy to Austrian domination, go back to that Austro-Hungarian map that we looked at a couple of slides ago. And Nabucco, which is the story of the Israelite captivity in Babylon, has that incredible uh, scene opens an act of the Israelites sitting. They're, they're recapitulating one of the Psalms. They're sitting on the banks of the river in Babylon. And they sing the famous uh, chorus, Va Pensiero. Go, my thoughts, remember the fatherland. Remember who we are. Remember that we must return. Da 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 Don't you wish I could sing? Anyhow, um, and used in a hundred commercials, the television, which I hate. But uh, when this, during the uprisings of 1848, productions of this around Italy had, especially in areas under Austrian control. The, in those days, the people who had the dough were up in the boxes. The orchestra were the just plain folk who could buy the cheap tickets and stand in the orchestra. And the orchestra, so you have Austrian soldiers and, and, and officer corps up and, and the local aristocracy, the, the, the complicit aristocracy in, in the boxes and down in the pit as the Bob Pensiero is being sung. There are revolutionaries waving the, the tricolor flag, uh, the red, white, and green. It must have been an extraordinary scene to, to, to be a knight in La Scala and, and see people smuggling flags in to enrage uh, the Austrian officer corps. Anyhow, uh, nature, nature, and romanticism. So uh, in the late 18th century, the German movement, storm and stress, Sturm und Drang, uh, extreme emotions, uh, given free expression and reaction to the perceived constraints of rationalism. And this, of course, is objectified by seeing nature in its, not in its pastoral solitude, but in its dynamism. And this becomes one of the other many romantic artistic tropes of the period. So you can think of Beethoven in music as an expression of Byron, Lord Byron in poetry. Turner, J.M.W. Uh, Turner. Joseph Mellard, William Turner. Uh, and on the left, this uh, proto-impressionist, if you call him that. Snowstorm, steamboat off a harbor's mouth. And uh, another snowstorm on the right in the Valdosta in Italy, avalanche and thunderstorm. And why am I because I tried to expand and get a, a sense of the, the roiling and the turmoil and the passion. And, and how many people 
of romantic bent in 1840 could stand in front of these and say, now this is authentic. This is not contrived. Yet, in another sense, it's the height of contrived. There we are. And, of course, romanticism with its um, obsession with the primitive. And we have, coming out of our period, the, the idea of the noble savage, the new Adam, uh, now in the state of nature. It's not Adam, it's Natty Bumpo of, of uh, the last of the Mohegans. Uh, and a quote from Fenimore Cooper. She's in the forest, Judith, hanging from the boughs of the trees in a soft rain and the dew on the open grass, the clouds that float about in the blue heavens, the birds that sing in the woods, the sweet springs where I slake my thirst, and in all the other glorious gifts that come from God's providence. And I, I picked, I went out of Europe. Uh, the colonies are not far, far removed from Europe. Uh, to look at a Thomas Cole of the, the early Hudson Valley guy. And, and, and this is, he calls this the last of the Mohicans. It's a scene from the book. And I want to point out how infinitesimally small the characters are and how nature is this grand Gothic cathedral with its soaring spire engulfing small humans who, because they are natural, are in their, their natural milieu, they're in the right context. They stand united with the infinite that vibrates through them and that surrounds them. Um, and of course, uh, from the same year, we've got uh, George Catlin, that wonderful artist of uh, the American Indians who went into the American West and, and, and to whom we owe many of the great uh, paintings and drawings of indigenous peoples, many of whom are almost tribes that are almost non-existent. And, and this one, going to and returning from Washington, that corollary of the noble savage, which is the natural man who's spoiled by civilization. So he goes in and he comes out as an Andrew Jackson dandy with umbrella and fan in hand. But romantic. And then, politics and romanticism. We're not done with revolutions. And I'm, we're going to talk about the big one, uh, 1848, uh, next time. But I wanted to point out that there is another round, the July Revolution in Paris in 1830, when the legitimist uh, Bourbon king replaces his Orleanist cousin, Louis Philippe. The king put in place in 1815 is displaced uh, by a cousin and constitutional monarchy is slightly further extended, slightly more popular sovereign, sovereignty than hereditary right. And here we have, you know, the, probably the most famous French revolutionary painting of the 19th century, which is not about the French Revolution, but the second one, Liberty Leading the People, the Eugène Delacroix. And you can tell by the style of dress that we're in 1830, not so much 1789. And uh, there was also uprisings in Belgium, and it allowed the Netherlands to secede and uh, Southern provinces of the Netherlands, which speaks other languages than Dutch. 
And here is a picture from the period. And again, and by the way, you'll start from 1830 on seeing tricolor flags for every country. They just, the tricolore. It is, it is not just Edit in a flag. Anyhow, let's switch bases entirely now. We have the revolution coming. From the revolutions, what should society look like? And industrialization and political revolution had utterly disrupted Western Europe, certainly by the 1820s. Now it, it's, and you'll see it in maps next time uh, of Europe where industrialization really burgeons. But by the 1820s, it's disrupting a lot of Western Europe. And questions arise, what should the world look like? The new ideas had largely stayed on the question of the ideal government, political reform. Now th theories begin to emerge on the related questions of the ideal person and the ideal society. Who should the new citizen be? Because in this new uh, industrialized world, the rural peasant stays are numbered. We're gonna have new people and a new kind of social grouping what should these groupings look like? Because right now, the ugliness of the urban centers of industrial production uh, don't look right and do not look inviting. And the first, and so a series of thinkers, we're only going to look at a, uh, really uh, three of them, a series of thinkers who began to have socialist, what begin to be called socialist ideas, ideas of, of group fixes rather than liberal individualistic fixes to the political landscape and, and wanted to fashion alternative groupings in society, but were not members themselves of the working class, nor did they see themselves as spokesmen of the working class. They often saw themselves as spokespeople for the working class, which for which uh, people like Marx are calling, going to call them utopians, that they're idealists. They wanted to produce theories of ideal societies that could be implemented, if you will, top down, not bottom up. So after the Napoleonic War ended, England experienced increased industrialization and extreme social disruption, bread riots, factory and machine burnings, the Luddites, uh, as they were called, homelessness, alcoholism, demon gin, I call it here the full Dickensian horror. And I just quoted just a couple lines from the famous William Blake poem that you may have heard sung, since there isn't an Englishman who doesn't know this lyric by heart. And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand. So we have built Jerusalem and England's green and pleasant land. Uh, so you get the romantic ideal now of a golden age that has been lost uh, coming up against this Dickensian horror. And there are people uh, of wealth and of education who see it and they see the social devastation uh, they, they see what it is costing the society in terms of, of human and spiritual capital, and they want to do something about it. Robert Owen, a man born well in the 18th century, 1771, uh, 
and lives until his late 80s, mid-century, is a wealthy manufacturer and philanthropist who saw this devastation and blamed it on the competition of human labor and machinery. He really thought the problem, he agrees with the Luddites to some degree, but the problem was, was with this new, the technology that is forcing human labor into slums and impoverishing it. In his new moral world, he recommended setting up civic sponsored, self sufficient communities that would usher in a society of happiness, enlightenment, and prosperity. So he wants to set up societies not unlike the religious groups that had set themselves up in the 17th century in the wake of the Protestant Reformation. You know, many of the, some of the Mennonites and Shakers and the like. Uh, communal living based on education, science, and technology, not on religion, this time would produce a superior social, intellectual, and physical environment. So the idea is let's take one or 2,000 people that have a group task. Uh, I immediately, when I first started reading people like Owen way back when, I immediately thought of uh, medieval monasteries that are set up as, as these kind of ideal communities where the community has a work in common and the work is equitably distributed and everyone is cared for internally and people are educated and their well-being is looked after. Um, he sees it in a secular model and, and begins to proselytize for it. So there are Owen communities. Uh, he and his uh, father-in-law in New Lanark, by the way, there's a photo of it down in the lower left here. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This, for, for socialists, uh, this was often a, uh, site for, a site for pilgrimage to go to New Lanark and see where the idea started. Uh, so he built a well-planned mill town, which would serve as a base model for his more advanced social th uh, theory. Each town would have one to one and a half thousand people. They live in a common building, so sort of like a grand hotel, uh, with public kitchen and dining halls. Each family would have its own private apartment and raise children up to the age of three. The kids would still see their parents a lot, but they, they then would move into the care of, it sounds like Plato's Republic here a bit, into the care of uh, the school for the community and would be raised by the community as a group with people who were educated in childcare techniques. Uh, work and the enjoyment of its results should be experienced communally. communally. You can see, by the way, how many of the uh, hippie communes of the 1960s went back and started reading up on Owenite communities. Uh, he funded uh, a model for New Harmony, Indiana, but it was never completed. This is a, uh, a picture of it that was supposed to be built in the late 1820s. Again, the quadrangular structure suggests medieval monastic communities. There were some six communities in the United States that are based on Owen's theories. Is, can, can, is everybody hearing me okay? Somebody said my voice keeps fading. Maybe I'm not sitting close enough to that. Yeah, I'm getting the same better? thing. I think it's I will better. Assume it is. Yeah, it, I can't hear you. You keep fading. It's driving me nuts. I can't. Secondly, hear. Um, Henri Comte de Saint Simon, 
a French nobleman, and actually very important social theorist. When, when you start reading him at first, he sounds uh, a bit like uh, a crackpot from modern, uh, to modern ears, but he's very much uh, on the cutting edge in his period. He's an, he believes in a managerial technocracy that's science-based. He believes that a socialist communal model should be set up, but it should be set up by people who are educated to fiddle with the gears and levers of uh, society, who could turn the wheels right, a, a meritocratic technocracy. He did see the French Revolution in terms of an economic change and a class conflict. And in his book, he, has, he writes a book called Industry. And in its Declaration of Principles, sort of its opening, he proposed the creation of a meritocratic industrial society comprised of all people engaged in productive work. He calls them the industrial class, and he contrasts it with the idling class. And for him, the idling class, this is topsy-turvy from a 21st century point of view, is not the non-working poor, the idling class is the aristocracy. Everybody else does have to do something to get through. And he prominently emphasized in this industrial class scientists and industrialists, but he included engineers and managers and bankers and manual workers. The role of government in, in his uh, grand scheme was to encourage industrial activity but not to intrude on that activity. Industry would decline if government intervened too strongly because he saw mercantilist France as just such a case. The French economy uh, gave certain companies exclusive rights to produce things. It kept prices high. And Saint-Simon understood the inefficiency of that. Given the fact that he was, by the time Napoleon arrived on the scene, he was 40 years old got to see a lot of it up close and personal. Um, his theory of tinkering with a technocratic world had a heavy influence on some early socialists, particularly Auguste Comte, who is the man who actually invents the term sociology, and who will be encountering in the fourth session. Anyhow, Saint Simonism develops into a kind of quasi political sect, almost a cult. After his death, it splits between two groups one who developed uh, and expand on the uh, core ideas and uh, voting rights for women abolition of inheritance, socialist community of goods, so private property is to be reorganized. But another side of the group develops this kind of introspective, uh, cult-like social group that they have strange costumes and the rumors that, that they have uh, sexual excesses and, and orgies and all sorts of things are said about them. And they come under heavy duty caricature uh, in the 19th century. And I have a couple of pictures here of women as workers. Here is a hunter. And here I believe is some sort of shoemaker. And ironically, this is meant to suggest the height of the ridiculous to a French audience in the early 19th century, but was uh, 
very novel in its time. Anyhow, and the last thinker in the group, uh, a man of slightly younger generation than Saint Simon, but a man of even wider influence, Fourier, Charles Fourier, also wanted to build uh, communities. And his communities, again, um, had models all over the Americas and all over uh, some spots in Europe. He believed that the community should be voluntarist and cooperative, and that human productivity would be unleashed because they would draw on the best of, the, of individual psychology. He did this extensive and elaborate analysis of, of psychological character. In fact, he said, I mentioned that here, he, he, he mentions that there are 800 human character types and, and wrote extensively on how you articulate the separate differences and how different types were drawn to different occupations and different interests. And some had interests in engineering and some had interests in whatever. And, and, and as a result, if his community could build upon a kind of psychological science, that was still voluntary, but still allowed people to develop their own best private interests, that this would serve the overall group in a scientific way and produce the best economic outcomes at the same time and still be perceived as voluntary and feel free. Um, I, should, I should mention, I didn't bring this out when I was talking about Rousseau early, early on in his, in his books and the idea of coercion and constraint and why the, a lot of the social utopians wanted to build communities that were ultimately voluntarist is that they were all heavily influenced by Rousseau and, and his intellectual descendants. But Rousseau believed that that sense of alienation and frustration is produced um, by having constraints placed upon you that you feel are arbitrary and not natural. So he starts using examples. He says, the fact that somebody in the Emile, he'll say, the fact that young Emile has got to do a lot of physical work to get certain things done. He wants to get the coconuts at the top of the tree. He's got to climb the tree. He does not find that burdensome. It's natural. It's a constraint. You want to walk into the other room. Well, here's a door. So I walk through the door. I'm constrained by walls, but I can walk through the door. If psychologically, Rousseau's essential point in Emile is, someone introduces a constraint that does not look like it is part of the natural furniture of the universe, the natural constraint of nature. If, for instance, I close the door, now that you can't get to that, and lock it so that you can't get into the next room, or arbitrarily build a wall between yourself and the next room, or arbitrarily build something on the palm tree that keeps you from climbing up to get the coconuts. This seems like it's, it's a human arbitrary imposition on what we popularly seem to be calling these days our freedoms. And that leads to the social alienation and psychological frustration that people experience in the larger world. 
So if these communities could be small enough so that everybody felt like they had a say in the government of them, one of the reasons why there were 1,000 people or 1,500, small town politics. If I go to the town hall meeting and somebody votes to put parking meters next to the, the town green and we all agree on it, I, I, I don't bitch and moan about bureaucrats imposing their will on the poor downtrodden masses of the little small town. So they wanted these small communities. They wanted them to be voluntarists. They wanted them to be self-realizing. And Owen and Fourier are, are very much, so is San Simone for that matter, on the same page. Property distribution, oh, I jumped one. He called his communities phalanxes. And they, again, look like these hotel buildings. And a, there's a phalanstera. There is. I've got to start the screen share again. Again. Again, it's not a quadrangle, but you get the hotel. Property distribution was going to be determined by need. Poverty was the greatest social ill and one's job. But since the jobs were assigned based on individual preferences, there would be a higher pay scale for the less desirable. So indeed, uh, somebody's got to take out the garbage, so you pay them a little more. So. You find somebody who's a little more motivated by money and you give them that job. Work was to be productive. Trade was considered a social evil. Uh, again, Marx is going to see these people as having turned everything on its head in this top-down view of the world rather than a bottom-up view. His then radical beliefs on women's rights, he coined the term feminism. All forms of sexuality and children's education drew on an, elaborate, on an elaborate theory of over 800 human character types. The ideal community would include members of each type. Um, and I mentioned in this box, uh, on the lower left here, that his stance against any form of repression, very Rousseauian in this, and his focus on the entire human psyche, desire, sexuality, art, Play, generated great interest among later thinkers who objected to the authoritarianism inherent in Marxist society. So for instance, people like Herbert Marcuse of the 1950s and 60s, that great countercultural theorist that the Abbey Hoffmans of the world were in love with, uh, found much to like in, in Fourier in particular. And again, as with Owen, many utopian communities in the USA were built on Fourier's model. And you even, you even hear echoes in things like some of the earlier Mormon communities, although they were religious, picking up ideas uh, from utopian socialists of this period. Anyhow, uh, I've left about 12 minutes. That's the end. I am going to invite questions. Okay. Mute, unmute everybody. You can unmute yourselves, so feel free. Lou, how does um, this, how does this- I'm sorry, Laurie, would you repeat that? Sure. How does this trend, if at all, set the stage for, for populism? Um, the rise of nationalism? Yes. 
It does. You'll find that most in places where the nationalist risings were ethnic centered. So you'll find that in places in, in Central Europe, more than in Western Europe, more than in England and France, you'll find that in sections of Hungary, the Slavic locations, Russia, the Ukraine, places like that, where you have multiple ethnicities, which isn't to say it will not jump ship and morph into all sorts of other things. But the whole idea that the, the voice of the folk is the voice of the little man um, will be expressed in that period. And, and early on, like the first nationalist poems and the like, often are imbued with higher ideals. So it's not so corrupted at that point in time, but things change. Well, I do well to point out. Anybody, observations are welcome. Rousseau sounds like uh, he would have been happy to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer in uh, Michigan. <laughs> He, uh, he, he sounds almost like, like he was bordering on being like an anarchist, right? Is he coming close to that, to an idea of um, anarchy? He wasn't really suggesting. I think what you have to read him as, as, as a cultural <clears throat> critic, not as a political theorist. And in fact, the only way, the only, you know, two of his books, um, a meal on one hand, the individual, the education of an individual boy that's done in this idealized world where no constraints are thrown in front of him until he is an adult and ready to venture out into the world. Okay? On one hand. And then the social contract, on the other hand, where uh, society is conceived as a uh, the general will, it's, it's like Plato's Republic, the general will imposed on the entire community as if it were a Spartan military camp. And he writes both books. And, and theorists ever since that time have tried to figure out how do you reconcile this image, this essay of ultimate personal freedom with one of, of, a, of a, spar a society built on Spartan boot camp principles. And the only way you can make sense of it is if you realize that in both cases, he wanted the individual to perceive themselves as free. Now, in one case, freedom was achieved by, in a sense, le letting the kid do anything that they want to do, but guiding them in a way so that they don't hurt themselves or other people in, in, in an almost impossible scenario. But let's say for the sake of argument, he idealizes it. And let's say, by the way, by the way, there were many child educational experiments in France in the late 18th century that tried this to, to disastrous effect. But let's say for the sake of argument, you could do it. On the other case, in the Spartan boot camp, people feel free because no one has what they don't have. In other words, there is no frustration at somebody arbitrarily imposing themselves on you. We're all in the same boat. So in effect, it's the freedom of boot camp, where there are no sergeants. Ultimately, <laughs> we're all we're all in the same boot camp, and so if you see Rousseau as as making, if you will, social and psychological points about the inequities of the world he finds himself in, and he builds as his theories two idealizations 
One, an idealization of, of, of a military society, and one, the idealization of, you know, the, the, the free, the wild child of the 1960s allowed to, to grow up and be taught by the universe what the rules of the universe are as two impossible ideals, but ones that point to why we are unhappy in the actual mixed world that we're in. What we're actually in is a world where there are social constraints on individual and individual freedoms imposed in ways that make it look at times unjust and imposed and frustrating. And he says, that's why I, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a very unhappy man in middle age in France in the middle of the 18th century, am going to say a lot of stuff about why I am pissed off. And it's gonna take the form of these idealized views of the world, which were sensationalist in, in his period. But you're right, in one sense, he can look like a fascist, in one sense he can look like an anarchist, but so could Plato, and probably for the same reason. It's like he's saying the only way you can have happiness in life is in one extreme or the other. Choose one of the extremes, but a golden mean down the middle is a moderation is not well, something we can have. Yeah, but, that, but, but I think he wants to, to the degree that he would be in the least practical, I think he'd be saying that the mean that what you want is to achieve something closer to fairness. So for instance, I think those utopian socialists are suggesting worlds that he'd be much more comfortable in than the one he actually found himself in. A France run by Jesuits in which, in which his books would be banned by censors who were invited to the same social soirees that he was invited to at drinking champagne. But their day job was to keep his books off the shelf. And I think he would want to punch somebody in the face. You know? Anyway. And they, they idealize nature as well. And nature is marvelous. But you know, from the perspective of say like uh, the noble savage, Nature is also unforgiving and it's very tough as well. I mean, of course, and this the, is the lives these people lived out in the wild was not exactly, you know, right. And this is why, lives. and this is why we call it romantic. Apparently, they, they didn't seem to have to contend with COVID. <laughs> or nature. hunting for a deer, these guys. <laughs> <We're> so, <laughs> I'm sure he, he ordered room service. He didn't have to sit there and try to capture a rabbit for dinner or something. Uh, Anything else? Or else? Yes. Oh. Go ahead, please. You know, the, the, the more you show us, the more you see about the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the more amazing it is that that thing managed to stay together as long as it did. It's absolutely astonishing. That's true. And I think it was because of the agreements made in 1648 at the end of the Thirty Years' War as, a, as the only way out from a total re religious war bloodbath that had killed one fifth of all German speakers in 30 years. And I said, okay, we will, it, it, it's sort of the Thomas Hobbesian view of the world. We will defer authority to a state that we might not love, but that'll keep us from savaging one another. And militarily, they used to have units where an officer wouldn't be able to communicate Absolutely. Most of them, he'd be sitting there and be, he'd have a unit made up of eight different groups who speak Absolute, eight different abs languages. Absolutely. Like, Does there anybody here who can, uh, you know, tell these guys what I mean? And, re and remember, the fact that modern Serbs can speak to modern Ukrainians already reflects a consolidation of dialects. Imagine what it was like, if it was anything like Italy was at the time, where every 20 miles the lingo people were speaking was 
impenetrable. I mean, you just you just couldn't leave your home region. Anyhow, Garibaldi but, and Victor Emmanuel had their work cut out for them, right? Oh, they certainly did. I always love um, Ludendorff's quote about uh, Austro-Hungary during World War I. He said, it, being allied to Austro-Hungary was like being shackled to a corpse. <laughs> <laughs> he I, wasn't a big fan of theirs. I, I never make it to, the world, to World War I. I, 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 I'm irrevocably locked into 1870 or earlier. Poor me. Anyhow, next weekend, 